Good morning. This morning's Sunday School lesson is God's Covenant with Noah. And um, as I was reading through this, there, there, there are basically five covenants that are made. There's the Noahic, N-O-A-H-I-C, covenant, where God's agreement with all living things and the sign of that is the rainbow. Then we have the Abrahamic covenant, which is uh, the large family, land of Cana, and that uh, the, uh, the act of circumcision and uh, the, uh, the, the law. Well, excuse me, an act of circumcision. Mosaic covenant is the, um, to make Israel a holy kingdom of priests and, uh, that, uh, uh, that through whom God's blessing could come to, the, to Israel and to the world, and they were to obey God's law. In David, the Davidic covenant, God promises to make his name, David's name great and raise up a descendant um, whose throne, he, who will sit on the throne of Israel forever. And then, of course, there is the new covenant. So whenever we start looking at um, the idea of covenants, we are, and, and today, whenever we're looking at Noah, Noah's, the, the covenant that is given to Noah is the first of the five. And all of these, it was interesting, God, reser God reserved the world through Noah. He initiated redemption through Abraham. He established a nation of Israel through Moses and promised an eternal shepherd, king, through David, and fulfillment of the covenant through Jesus. So all of these are like building upon one another to the uh, arriving at the new covenant through Jesus Christ. So whenever we um, read then here in our lesson about Noah and how that God establishes a covenant with him, uh, and with the sign of it being the rainbow, uh, we see how God is beginning this whole plan of redemption of what he has promised, his, um, his uh, I can say, dislike, his hatred <laughs> for um, sin and his, his um, nature of grace and mercy to extend a way of salvation. So um, we have studied how God uses, used a great flood to bring judgment on the earth, and this is evident uh, that our God is holy, righteous, and just. So whenever we begin to think about God, we think of his grace and his mercy, but we also must remember he is just and that he is holy and that he, he desires for his people to, to walk with him and to be, you know, to establish this covenant, this agreement, um, that we would walk with that, within that agreement so that his blessing would be upon our life. Uh, it is his nature to extend grace and mercy. We see this through um, the uh, salvation of Abraham, saving them and his three sons uh, on, on the ark and their wives, that we see God's mercy extended to them and extended to mankind, humankind, that he preserved a group from uh, the, the sinful, uh, pre, you know, antediluvial, um, group of people, there was those that were saved. So after the flood, God demonstrated his grace and goodness by establishing a, this covenant with Noah. So this is the first time in scripture that the word covenant is mentioned. And God initiates the covenant. And um, it, 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 it sets forth a pattern that is used throughout the Bible, the rest of the Bible, with the other covenants. So we find that if there is, no, if there is one cons consistent theme in the section of Genesis, it is God's mercy and, and God's goodness. So sometimes we would look at this and say, oh, well, it's God's judgment. No, it's God's mercy in that he saved uh, some. He saved humankind. And we see his, uh, his goodness in that he restored them and gave to them um, the promise of blessing and the promise to, uh, that he would be faithful to them. So all of this is seen in the, um, these, these scriptures that we are about to read in Genesis chapter 8. As we look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. You remember what the clean, an clean animals are? Uh, remember what he was supposed to do with the clean animals? He was to take seven. 
Remember? There were six that were for breeding, one for sacrifice. And we find that the, the clean animals were, um, where were they? Seventh, uh, there's somewhere in here I have them. But anyhow, um, we have where Abraham, after, he, after he's uh, left the ark, uh, after he has kind of established, maybe established himself somewhat, and the animals are still hanging around the ark, because he takes the seventh animal uh, and, be, and that one becomes the sacrifice. So of all of the clean animals, um, we'll go through here, verse 21, and the Lord smelled the sweet savor. So when Abraham offered, excuse me, when Noah offered these sacrifices, the sacrifice to the Lord, it became as it were a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. Um, the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, the cold and the heat, the summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So Noah then takes, um, he builds an altar um, he is not commanded to build an altar. So um, he, he, he builds this altar. Perhaps he is, you know, the stories of um, um, Adam and Eve and, uh, you know, and um, Cain and Abel and the, the building of the altar and, uh, and the sacrifices. Uh, so some of these stories have, have um, stayed with them down through the centuries uh, and have reached uh, and have come to Noah. So these traditions or these stories were passed on because nowhere is it said, uh, declared that Noah should build a, an altar. But just that whenever he took these animals into the ark, the, the seventh one was taken for a sacrifice. So that's an implication that there's going to be an altar, but none, none is, is, is set up. So... The, um, the clean animals that were used in the offering were cattle, sheep, goats, and birds. And it would have been a considerable task for Noah and his son because um, they had to gather the stones to construct an altar. Then they would have had to uh, gather all of the wood <laughs> to be able to burn the uh, sacrifices. And, and, this, and this type of a sacrifice, a burnt offering, the whole offering was to be consumed. <laughs> so all of these animals that were on the ark of their kind, the clean ones, they had to be sacrificed, butchered, and, and put upon the altar and burned unto the Lord as a sacrifice. So this would have taken you know, a lot of work for uh, Abraham and his sons. One of the, and it says here that there's no, it's not mentioned that Abraham prayed. Well, I'm sure that um, he, he didn't just do this to, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, to amuse himself. He did it because he felt that it was the right thing to do before God. And the God who had spoken to him to build an ark, he is now offering him the praise of the ark continuing, you know, going through the flood, landing on dry ground. And then um, now he's built an ark and he's offering this sacrifice to God for all the good that he has done in the saving of his family. The offering was a sweet savor. It was a pleasant aroma. God was pleased with Noah's sacrifice. His worship delighted the Lord. Now, also, we find that in the past, the Lord cursed the ground when Adam sinned. And additionally, he cursed the ground in his judgment of Cain and now he declared that he would no longer add curses, a uh, curse upon curse, meaning that uh, he would he would put now this, the the, the uh, idea of promise. So rather than cursing evil, he he you know um, he is uh, blessing good. And we'd say, well, you know, doesn't God know that? Yeah, he does. But what we're seeing is in in the transit in this transition. We're seeing how that we are told that to, to do good, you know, in the New Testament, to do good to those who do, do evil and, you know, and, and don't uh, return evil 
uh, for don't return evil for evil, but return good for evil. So what it is doing is basically saying what what is initiated here, cursing upon cursing upon cursing doesn't build anything good. <laughs> so, in so in showing this, it isn't that God is learning in the process, it's that through the process, God is showing us um, the, the whole idea of, of um, how that cursing upon cursing doesn't do anything. But we find where blessing upon blessing upon that which is good, that's where the, the growth and the development uh, comes from. Oh, and also the pattern of, um, the, the weather pattern will return. <laughs> Summer, winter, you know, more, I mean, night and day, all those things will, will return. Me, in my imagination, I, I wonder, you know, because if you look at the earth and, and, and how that it seemingly all fits together, and then kind of how it all broke apart and the continent, continents kind of separated and all that, I wonder when that happened. You know, maybe it was during the flood. Mm, then again, maybe not. I, I you have no idea. No one's ever, I never read that anywhere. It was just, uh, it was just a passing thought, you know. Probably some really smart guy says, well, you should just keep the thought going, you know. <laughs> it's not there. Chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, unto your hand are they delivered. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall be his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So in this first section of one through five, we find that um, Noah and his family are told to replenish the earth, repopulate the earth. And um, Noah has become, and I don't like the term second Adam, because Jesus, as in the first Adam, all die, as in the second Adam, Christ, all are made alive. So Noah is not the second Adam, but Noah is like Adam in the garden, Adam and Eve, because it is from them all of the descendants of the earth will come. We find that um, man lived before the flood, man lived in harmony with all of the animals and uh, the wildlife and so on. And now he's saying that the animals will have a fear of people. Before, God had instructed both humans and animals to eat plants, so we were, they were vegetarians before the fall, uh, before, before the flood. Now people were allowed to eat meat. While some of the animals still ate uh, grass and grains, we now some of them are carnivorous and would eat uh, meat from, from this time on. So things changed after, after the flood. There was one prohibition, they were not allowed to eat blood. And the, re the reason for that is, um, is that the blood represented the life, the life of the person, the life of the animal. And the life of the animal was sacred to God because in the, in the altar, when, God, when the lamb was slain, the blood of the lamb was sprinkled upon the altar. So if people were able to eat or drink the blood, it would make uh, the blood seemingly of no effect or, or, or very common. But with the sacrificial system, that is the life of the animal is given and so its blood is shed, and so you are honoring the animal by not drinking its uh, blood, but you're also honoring God because the blood would have been shed for the, the, the sins of the people. And of course, uh, the value of human life, <laughs> you, you, you're not allowed to take a life. Um, and if you take a life, your life shall be taken, capital punishment. It was grievous the word they use here, uh, to shed uh, a human blood, to take a human life. Then verse 8. Do you have any questions? Kind of jumping along here. I'm not really jumping, I'm sitting and moving quickly. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, all right. Okay, it's like the guy said, I'm going to jump across the creek, and the kid says, you're going to jump, Dad? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not jumping. I'm taking a walk across the creek. Uh, anyhow, this is the covenant in Genesis 9, verse 8 through 11. 
And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, for all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall they any more a flood, a, be a flood to destroy the earth. So we find that God is making a covenant, and often we think of this covenant as God's agreement between Noah and him, you know, between the, 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 the two, uh, the, you know, God and Noah and his family. But God is making a covenant between, God is making a covenant with all living things. So God is extending his covenant to all the living things of the fowl and the cattle and beast of the earth, everything that breathes, basically. He is establishing this covenant. And Noah was the first person to enter into a formal covenant um, with God. And the word covenant means cutting. And a covenant is, was made by sacrificing an animal and dividing it into two pieces. Now, back when Abraham, no, Abraham's after this. Well, Abraham, um, back when, forward when Abraham um, establishes a covenant with God, he has this dream or he has this vision or this reality in which he, he, he prepares a sacrifice and he cuts the sacrifice in half and lays one half on one side and the other half on the other and God and he pass through. And so when you pass through, you are establishing a covenant between the, between the two who are passing through and the sacrifice becomes a sacrifice of the, uh, for that covenant. Well, it, it's interesting how, how that whenever Jesus Christ has established a new covenant, that we are passing through the old life and the new life, as it were, the, the, the life that we have here on earth and the life that we're going to have in heaven, and that Christ has become the bridge between the two, and we walk through what Christ has done for us. It's kind of similar to that. So there are several uh, ritualistic elements that are uh, involved in this covenant between God and the survivors of the flood. Um, there was the covenant of sacrifice. There were the promises and the binding oaths. Um, God's covenant with Abraham required that his descendants be circumcised. With Moses, Moses the covenant required an observation of the, uh, observance of the Sabbath. And we find that with Noah, a visible sign was with the rainbow. So all of these, all of the covenants have a significant sign that they, are, that, they, that they carry with them. So the binding oath of God in the Noahic covenant is his promise to never again flood the entire world. So this is the Noahic covenant that God will never again uh, destroy the world by water. We do know that in Revelation it talks about, or Second Peter, and in the book of Revelation, talking about the heaven and earth will pass away, that God will destroy the earth by fire. Uh, so it's, it's that time's coming, but in the covenant that he established, he's never going to do it again by, um, by water. And God said, this is the token of the covenant. So what is the token that God has given that um, is between God and Noah and every living creature for the perpetual generations, I do, verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. So, one of the things, it's in case I don't remember, um, that verse 15, and I will remember my covenant. God is the one, you know, God is the one, and every time there's a rainbow, you know, we think, well, we, we think, oh, that's God's promise, but it's also, it's, a, it's, a, it's like God is, um, 
reminding himself as if, he, no, he's not going to forget, of course. But it's like this is a sign that I am putting there, a sign of, of, of uh, who I am and my agreement with you that this is never again, I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. This um, covenant here with uh, Noah, it, it is mentioned eight times. <laughs> so eight times God uses the word covenant here with Noah and uh, bringing about th the idea of establishing it. And uh, we are familiar with the token of God's covenant, the rainbow. Uh, the rainbow uh, is in the Hebrew it signifies a bow used to shoot arrows. It's important that um, God established that the rainbow <laughs> is a sign that he will not destroy the earth again with water. And that some of the um, ancient, in, in antiquity, the, the rabbis said that, you know, the, the bow was uh, a, an instrument of war. And um, whenever the bow is in the sky, it is that the bow is shooting outward <laughs> from the earth so that the, you know, no longer will the earth be punished by the flood. So, the, the, you know, it's like the, it is going away from the earth. So I thought that was interesting. The other times that the, the rainbow is used in scripture is Ezekiel. Uh, says that the, he saw the Lord in majesty, glory, and with a radiance around him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. That's Ezekiel. Then in Revelation 4, John saw God enthroned in heaven and a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like unto an, an emerald. And uh, both visions, the grandeur and magnificence of the Lord, were displayed with the idea of a rainbow. Gener Genesis 9, 14 says, The rainbow will appear in the clouds, and I will remember my covenant. I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living thing on the earth. <laughs> I like that. We also find, oh, in verse 18. The sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Cana. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So there were basically eight souls, eight people who were, came out from the flood that were preserved in the ark. The group uh, consisted of Noah and his wife, and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Ham is the uh, Canaanite. And uh, from, his, from his descendants came the Canaanites, and from the line of Shem comes the uh, line of Abraham and uh, uh, David and Jesus. So let's read on here. Verse 22. And Ham, the father of Cana, saw the nakedness of his father. What happens is, so Noah... I, I like the, uh, the idea, somebody was doing a, uh, when God, you know, he was using it in the sense that God only uses perfect people. You know, he doesn't use people who get drunk, <laughs> Noah. He doesn't use people who look on uh, a, a lust after a woman and, and have an affair with her and kill her husband, <laughs> David. You know, God only uses perfect people, <laughs> yeah. The idea is God uses, and it's his grace and his mercy that is extended. In this case, here we find Noah. He, you know, they've been out of the ark for some time, and uh, Noah has uh, established a vineyard. And um, so what do you do when you have grapes? You make a grape salad. <laughs> and so he made a little wine. Well, he, he got a little drunk on, um, on, on the wine that he had made. And um, so he, he runs around naked. He must have really been drunk. And he told his two brethren, so Ham then, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, so Ham then sees his father's nakedness, and Shem and Japheth took a garment. So anyhow, Ham and the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of the father and told his two brethren. So what happens is, you know, you read that and you say, well, yeah, he's a guy, he got drunk, 
and he's running around naked and Ham sees him. And so what's the big deal? Why does he end up getting cursed? Uh, well, the, the, the wording, the verbiage here is that Ham being the middle son, this is my interpretation, being the middle son is the one who's over uh, often, he, he has this um, um, identity crises that the, the firstborn and the, and, the, and, the, and the little one, the youngest one, they get all the attention. Well, anyhow, it is assumed that Ham, whenever he looks on his, his father, has the intent of like, wow, what a foolish man he is. You know, it's like he's making fun of his father. And so to, ma to take it even worse, he goes and tells his brothers about what their father's doing. So it's like he's, he's really, like, you, you should see what, he, he's rebelling against his father's, um, against his father's uh, authority. So that's kind of the implication here that whenever you see Ham here getting his um, um, curse from, from his father. So Shem and Japheth, they have the, the correct understanding. They, they laid it upon their shoulders. They took a garment and laid upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And the, their face went where, and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. So it isn't, well, it is that he was naked, but the idea was they weren't uh, belittling their father because of what he did. Ham, in this in the case, was belittling the father. You know, we're gonna we're gonna rub it into him what he's doing. So something to that effect. Verse twenty four. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, and he said, Cursed be Cana, the servant of servants shall be he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord of Lord God of Shem, and Cana shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Cana shall be his servant. So um, Ham, his son, is Cana. So um, where does the Abraham go whenever he, God gives him a promised land? He goes to the land of Canaan. <laughs> and so the, the fulfillment of this curse upon Ham's descendant son, Canaan, is that God will give the land of Israel, the, the people of Shem, they shall take over and possess the land of Canaan, the, uh, Ham's son. Ta-da. Didn't know that, did ya? Neither did I. <laughs> but anyhow, that's how it works. So Noah then continued his prophesying and pronouncing blessing, and as we said, Shem through his descendants comes Abraham and comes uh, David and then eventually comes the Messiah. And that the uh, Japheth, his descendants dwell in the tents of, of, of uh, Shem, basically that they follow, they, it would be like they're following the leadership of, their, uh, of, of Shem's family. But they are the ones that travel all over the world. You know, they're the ones that repopulate everything. And then Noah's long life, verse 28. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So Noah was 600 whenever he went into the ark, spent 120 years building the ark. And then, you know, there he was. He spent 120 years building his motel and just lived in it for a year. You know, <laughs> his floating motel. Um, that was long enough, I'm sure. Uh, so he lived for another 350 years after that and lived to 950. He is the last of that generation that would live to those exceedingly long years. It was by the time of Moses, the people lived to 70 and 80. So Noah was the uh, last of those long livers. Uh, Shem la lives 500 years and um, the generation to generation continued to decrease. Um, so the, what is the reason? Well, some, the, the commentary talks about being the uh, increase of biological and environmental factors or just the idea that the, the, the uh, gene pool is uh, now <laughs> not as great as what it was at the beginning with Adam and Eve. So there was, you know, whenever the genetic line of Adam and Eve, they were pure and... They were intelligent and 
you know, they could use their whole brain. <laughs> and then, you know, some of us now are just running around with a part of a brain. And uh, uh, we won't go there. So anyhow, that's how, he, that's how we have the covenant that is given to Noah, that he, the rainbow, the bow in the sky is God's promise to all living things that they, the earth will not be destroyed by water again. Take that, would you? What else? Questions? So next week is one race, many nations. So from Noah comes all of these nations, and we're going to find out how all that happens. And we remember Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and all of that goes together. But we have the establishment of the covenant, the agreement that God has made with Noah. And the, the agreement, the sign of that agreement is the rainbow. And the rainbow is a sign to remind people but is that God reminds himself of the covenant that he has made with all living things. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for the agreement that you've made with us in the new covenant through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that through him all the world will be blessed. And then by your grace and mercy, Lord, you, you touch our lives, and we are grateful for how that you move through your word to inspire the truths and inspire our hearts and minds that we might follow you. So bless your word to us and establish our faith. We pray in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.